Welcome to Train Signal. You're watching a video about network access protection, or what's more simply known as NAP. In this video, I'll start off by going over exactly what NAP is. Then we'll take a look at the four NAP enforcement types, IPsec, 802.1x, VPN, and DHCP. Then we'll take a look at some of the NAP components, system health agents, system health validators, and health requirement policies. Then we'll go into Windows Server 2008 and take a look at exactly how to install and configure NAP. So first of all, what is NAP? Well, as I said before, NAP stands for Network Access Protection. I know you've watched a lot of videos in this course and you're probably thinking, NAP, that's about what I want to do right now. I want to take a nap. Well. Not yet, you can't do that. First, we have to learn about network access protection. Now, NAP, as an overall concept, is something that is used to evaluate what we could call the health of a computer. Now, we'll see that there's a number of different factors that can determine the health. As a, for instance, we might look to see if firewall has been enabled on a computer, or whether automatic updates is enabled. and to be more specific, to see whether the system has been brought up to date with the latest updates. Or we might look at firewall, anti-spyware, things of that nature as well. We'll take a look at all that in a little bit later. But let's get back to what NAP is. What happens here is NAP is used to evaluate the health and then compare it against a corporate policy which determines exactly what level of access a computer can have to your network. Now the really cool part about this is that if a computer does not meet the requirements to gain access to your internal network, instead of just simply being denied, it can be sent to what's called a remediation network, which would then potentially give it the opportunity to fix or improve or upgrade its health status. And you'll see here that I said sometimes automatically. And that's the super cool part, is you can actually set it up so that certain aspects of health, if they are not met, and there is the means to automatically bring it up to speed, we can do so. Now we'll take a look at that when we go into the operating system and set this all up. Now let's take a brief look at the four NAP enforcement types. Now before we even get into this, one thing I'd like to point out is, you know, if you just look at these names, IPsec 802.1x, which you'll notice is listed for wired, or what's very commonly thought of and used as for wireless connectivity, VPN and DHCP, well, these are all topics that we've already covered in this course in other videos. In other words, when it comes to network access, and protecting that network access, well, you've already learned a lot about this stuff. And the first one here, IPsec, well, if you're going to use IPsec enforcement, this requires a client to meet certain health requirements in order to receive what's called a health certificate so that that client can then connect to other IPsec protected hosts. So basically what it means is, you know, in, in the last video we learned about IPsec and we learned about connecting from an IPsec client to an IPsec protected server, we'll say. Well, in this case, we're going to take it one step further and say, well, if we're going to implement IPsec NAP enforcement, we have to meet some health requirements before we even get into the rest of the requirements to connect via IPsec. Now the next one, 802.1x, Although very often it is thought of as wireless connectivity, 802.1x is something that can be used in both a wired and or wireless configuration. Now 802.1x NAP enforcement would give complete control over access to your network. And one of the cool things about 802.1x enforcement is through the use of a special 802.1x switch, you have the ability to send a client to many different networks, whether it be a virtual LAN, a VLAN, or an actual specific local network, 
based upon different criteria. So it, in this instance, you don't have just the do you get in or don't you get in. So as a, as a for instance, if a client met all the health requirements necessary, you could send them to the you know internal network. If the client does not meet the requirements, you could maybe send them in this instance to that remediation network that I mentioned just a few moments ago. Or maybe you have clients that are old and don't even support NAP. Well, you could send them to a, a different network which is designed to support older clients. So you have a lot of flexibility with 802.1x enforcement. The next one is VPN. And VPN enforcement is, well, pretty much what it sounds like. It allows you to control access coming from your remote clients. NAP enforcement with VPNs allows you to give a much stronger level of filtering and control from the users that are coming in from outside of your internal physical network. And then the last one is DHCP, which again, probably exactly what you would guess, basically says, look, you need to meet certain health requirements or I'm not giving you an IP address. All right, so those are the four primary NAP enforcement types. Now let's look at some of the components. The first two components I'd like to talk to you about here are what's called system health agents, or SHAs, and system health validators, or SHVs. Now the system health agents are the client component which would validate the health of the client computer. So it resides actually on the client computer and is validating the health of that computer. And then it creates, and you're going to love this, you know, you look at a statement like this, it says the SHA creates the SOH and sends it to the SHV. That's enough to make your head spin. Well, to put this in a little bit more plain English, it creates a statement of health, that's what the SOH is, and that's that statement of health that then gets sent to the SHV, which is the system health validator, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. Now, I have here a bullet point that says requires Vista Server 2008 or XP with Service Pack 3. And it's not so much that it requires those. It's that those three operating systems come with a built-in system health agent for the Windows Security Center. So primarily, those are the clients that you're going to use if you're going to be setting up NAP. Now I will tell you that whether it be Microsoft or whether it be a third party, additional system health agents can be created for all sorts of different operating environments. But by default, Vista, Server 2008, and XP with Service Pack 3 all have this agent built in for the security center. Now let's move on down to this system health validator. This is the server component, and here we go with all the acronyms again, which analyzes the information presented by the SHA, and what was that information that was presented? Well, it was the SOH that got presented, and produces, <laughs> you're gonna love this, an SOHR, which, if you can remember, SOH is Statement of Health. Well, SOHR is Statement of Health Response. And that response is then used by the policy server to determine the level of access to be granted. Let me tell you something. This, I, I've read numerous books on this, I've read numerous articles on this, and it can get quite confusing, especially with all the acronyms. I actually watched an online presentation of NAP once, and I went ahead and tallied in the first 60 seconds, so if you picture only 60 seconds, I tallied acronyms being used 20 times. <laughs> That's once every three seconds. So let me see if I can kind of just put this whole thing into some plain English for you. The bottom line is, is that you have an agent component that sits on the client and keeps track of how it's doing from a health point of view. It comes up with a report, we'll say, of that status and sends that report to the server. There's a validator on the server which then takes that report and really does nothing more than 
rewords the report so that it can be compared against a policy, and then the policy is used to determine the actual level of access based upon the actual health requirement. Now, I hope that helped you. If it didn't, maybe go back a minute or so into this video and listen again. Uh, but I will tell you, if, if you're feeling a little bit confused, it is somewhat normal. This is a, a real complicated set of services that they have set up here. But in reality, it all works much easier than what it sounds like. And you'll see that when we get into the operating system. All right, now, the last thing I want to talk to you about before we go in and look at the operating system itself are the health requirement policies. Health requirement policies, I'll tell you what, they are kind of the who, what, why, when, where, and how of network access protection. It's your health requirement policy that is going to determine, first of all, exactly who or what type of clients have to meet certain health requirements, what those certain health requirements are, and what you're going to do about it if they don't meet those requirements. Okay, so really the health requirement policy is how we bring this all together and make it work. Now, the health requirement policy is made up of five subcomponents, if you will. The first is a connection request policy. This just flat out determines whether a request should be processed or not. Okay, so this is just determining whether the request is going to be processed. Very, very simple. The next thing would be the system health validator. Well, we just talked about what the system health validator was. It's used to check whether the client has actually met the requirements. The next component is the remediation server group. By creating a remediation server group, you can determine whether a client is allowed to access certain servers which may help to bring up its health status. The next component is the health policy. Now this is what defines the actual health requirements using the SHV or the system health validators settings. Now you'll set up health policies for both compliant and non-compliant clients. Okay, so you'll and you'll see all this by the way. If you're if you're feeling confused with any of these right now, we're gonna see this all in just a few moments. But you're gonna have a health policy for those clients that do meet the requirements, and you're gonna have a health policy for those that don't meet the requirements. So it's kind of like saying the system health validator is going to determine whether they meet certain requirements, but then the health policy determines what to do now that you have certain ones who do and certain ones who don't. And then finally, we have the network policy. Now, we've seen the network policy before when we looked at remote access connectivity, and pretty much it hasn't really changed much here. It's, it's the exact same item in the exact same tool. It defines a level of network access that clients are going to get based upon whichever health policy they match. Okay, as opposed to before we saw the network policy had to do with other criteria when coming in via remote access. Well, that's enough talk. Why don't we get into this here and actually install and configure NAP and see how the whole thing works. Now, for this demonstration, we're going to need two different computers. We're going to use New York DC1 as our server, and this server is actually going to play multiple roles, and we're going to use New York Vista 1 as our client. Now, what I want to do in this example is I want to set up DHCP enforcement with network access protection. Now, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, this should be pretty straightforward and not that difficult to follow along and understand, but I do want you to know that there are a lot of steps involved and I want you to feel free to pause the video at any point if you feel you're falling behind and and make sure you understand where we're at and get caught up and possibly even come back and do this exercise a second time if you don't totally get it after the first time so basically let me go ahead and connect to New York DC 1 while we're connecting I will tell you that what we're gonna do is set up this enforcement 
and show you how the client is denied the ability to get an IP address or at least a valid IP address from the DHCP server and then we'll fix the health requirements on the client and then see how we actually get an IP address that is valid on our network. So the first thing we need to do on New York DC1 is add a couple of roles. So I'm going to click Start and select Server Manager. Once in the Server Manager, I need to click on Roles and then Add a Role. Now, the two roles that I need to add are the DHCP server role because, <laughs> let's be real, if we're going to do DHCP enforcement, we have to have a DHCP server. And then we're going to also add the Network Policy and Access Services role so that we can do NAP. I'm going to go ahead and click on Next. I get an introduction to what Network Policy and Access Services is. I'll click Next. And now I need to select exactly which services I want to install within this role. Now we've seen this role before. And the last time we looked at this role, we set up routing remote access services. Well, now we're going to go ahead and set up the network policy server. I'm going to click Next. And here's the introduction to the DHCP server. Click Next. And now it's going to take us through the initial installation of DHCP. So we have our bindings. It's connecting to our one network card. Next. DNS settings, it's pointing to ourself. That's perfect because we are a DNS server. If we didn't trust that we were a DNS server, I could click on validate and you'll see it's valid. Click on next. We don't need wins for this particular network. Next. Now here we get to add a scope if we want to and I'm going to go ahead and add this now. I'm going to click on add and I'm going to go ahead and we're going to give this scope the name NAP Clients. We'll give it a starting IP address of 192.168.1.50 and an ending IP address of 192.168.1.99. Okay, so we're going to give a, a nice range of IP addresses that I know will not conflict with anything that we already have statically on our network. The subnet mask is going to be 255.255.255.0 and we'll put in the default gateway of 192.168.10.201. And I'm just noticing here that I put 1 instead of 10, so let me correct that now. There we go. And then for subnet type, well, I could either use wired or wireless. It doesn't matter. It's a matter of how long the least duration will be for. It really doesn't matter. And I can choose whether I want to activate this scope right now or not. I'm going to say, yeah, go ahead and activate it. We're ready to rock and roll with this scope. Now, by the way, as I'm setting up DHCP here, if there's anything that you don't understand, feel free to go back to the DHCP video and see how this was all done. So I'll go ahead and click on Next. And now I need to set up DHCP version 6, so we'll just skip through there. I have to give it an entry here just to make it happy. Click Next. And authorizing, we're going to go ahead and authorize using my current credentials because I am an enterprise administrator who can do that. And I'm going to click Install. Now this will take a few minutes to install There's because there's a couple of different roles that it's installing now. But again, I do want to emphasize if, if you didn't understand any of what I just did in DHCP, because I know I kind of whipped through it quickly, go back to the DHCP video and see how that's done. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and pause the video and I'll be right back with you as soon as it's done installing these roles. Okay, the roles have been installed and uh-oh, let's take a look here. You'll notice that network policy and access services installation was just fine. But the DHCP server has an error. And the error that I received here that you may or may not have received on your end is it says attempt to configure DHCP server failed because the, the specified servers are already present in the directory service. What that means is it has to do with authorization of the DHCP server. Because I had previously authorized this DHCP server, in a past video, it's saying, hey, you didn't need to authorize again. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and click on close to this wizard. And let's close the server manager. The first thing I want to do is let's, let's make sure DHCP is OK. Let's make sure that error was not consequential. So I'm going to click administrative tools and DHCP. And what I see here is that it has been installed. 
I don't have the red down arrow, so I think we're okay. If I expand IP version 4, I have a green up arrow saying that it's active and all is well. So the fact of the matter is, is that even though I was given an error, the error was basically telling me that I went one step too far and that it was already authorized. The other step that I could do is if I right click on the server, you'll notice that it's giving me the choice to unauthorize it, which again tells me that it's already authorized. So I'm going to go ahead and close the DHCP console because we're done configuring DHCP. There's nothing else we have to do there. That was all set up when we set up the role. And if you didn't get an error, you never had to go to the DHCP console at all anyway. What we do need to do is go to the Network Policy Server Console to set up NAP. So I'm going to click on Start, Administrative Tools, and here we have Network Policy Server. Okay, in the Network Policy Server Utility. Now uh, again, I'm going to try to be as detailed as I can be with this. What, we're, what we need to do first is down here where it says Standard Configuration, what configuration do we want? Well, we want to do network access protection. There are other choices. Okay, we could do radius for dial over VPN or radius for 802.1x. We've seen radius for VPN before, but for right now, we're going to do NAP. That's what we're interested in doing. Based upon this selection, we click this link to configure NAP. And this takes us into the NAP configuration wizard, if you want to call it that. The first thing you have to decide is what network connection method you want to deploy for NAP. So if you see here there's none, if I expand this down, do we want to do DHCP or IPsec or 802.1x, what do we want to do? Well we want to do DHCP enforcement. Then we need to give the policy a name and quite honestly the default NAP DHCP, I think that's a good name because it says exactly what we're doing. So we're going to leave that policy name alone and say NAP DHCP works and go ahead and click on next. Now we have to determine who are the NAP enforcement servers and quite honestly what it's asking is who are the DHCP servers on your network or at least which ones are going to participate in this. So I'm going to click on add and here we're going to put in New York DC1 2K8 that's the name of the server and the IP address is 192.168.10.201 now we don't have to worry about this shared secret this has to do with when you're doing actual radius because this is DHCP enforcement it's not necessary so we're just gonna click OK so here although this says radius clients really this is your list of DHCP servers so I'm gonna click next now I need to specify which DHCP scopes I want to have involved. Now I only have one scope on my one server, so there's really nothing to specify. If I had more than one scope, and I only wanted one or some, so anything short of all my scopes to participate, I would need to add them here. But since I want all the scopes, I could just leave this blank and click Next. And it, you'll notice right here it even says that. If you do not specify any scope, the policy applies to all NAP enabled scopes on the selected DHCP servers. And that is something that I will show you in just a little bit where we go into DHCP and enable, or I should say NAP enable, the scope. So I'm just going to click Next because we don't want to specify any individual scopes. Now this next screen works pretty much the exact same way. If you wanted to specify certain groups of computers that you were going to go ahead and apply this to you could do so here by clicking next by default it just goes to everybody so I'm gonna click on next now I can choose a NAP remediation server or group to allow the client to still gain access to in an effort to correct its health requirement shortcomings so what I'm going to do here is, is I'm going to click New Group, because there are none. You see there's nothing to choose from. So I'm going to click New Group. And for the group name, I'll just put in DHCP Remediation, if I could spell, Remediation <laughs> Servers. I will click Add, New York, DC1, 
and put in the IP address 192.168.10.201 and click OK. Now what this is doing is this is basically saying, hey, I'll still let you connect to this server in an effort to improve your health requirements. Click OK. Now down here is where you could enter a web page that would be presented to the users with instructions on what to do to get themselves in compliance with your policy. Now I don't have a web page that does this, but if you have one, if you want to put a web page in place that gives these instructions, you put the URL here and a client who does not meet the requirements and especially if that client needs some kind of manual or user intervention to get up to the health requirements you can put the instructions in a web page it's pretty cool I'm gonna go ahead and click on next and now I need to go ahead and specify a system health validator and you'll see here that the only one I have to choose from, the only one that's built in, is the Windows Security Health Validator. And this is an extra cool little checkbox right here, which is where it says enable auto remediation if possible. I'm going to leave that checked because I'm going to show you, when we're all done, a client which is not meeting the health requirement and then is automatically made to meet the health requirement. And then down here, I say, well, what do I want to do if it's a NAP ineligible client computer? Meaning, what if it's a client computer that doesn't even have the ability? Do I want to deny them or do I want to allow them to come in? So we'll say go ahead and deny, although that's not going to be a factor here because the only client we're going to use is Vista and it is eligible. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Next. And then basically, here's just a review of everything you're about to do. And you'll see here that we have some of these components that we've seen before. The components that make up the health requirement policy, well here they are. You have your connection request policy, your health policies, your network policies, remediation server groups, and the actual clients. We have everything. So I'll go ahead and click on finish. Now that I have set up the actual policy, I need to go back to my DHCP server and enable NAP on the scope. So I'm going to click on Start, Administrative Tools, DHCP. In the DHCP utility, I will expand the server and click on IP version 4. And then actually, I'm going to right click on IP version 4 and go to Properties. In these properties, there's a tab for Network Access Protection. And I'm going to click this button right here that says Enable on All Scopes. So I'll click that button, and it says this will overwrite the settings of the scopes. And I'm going to say, yep, I want to do that. So now it's been enabled. And then it wants to know, well, what would be the behavior if the network policy server is unavailable? And then we're going to go ahead and say, well, no, restrict access. So basically, if you can get to the server, they're going to have to meet the requirements. If you can't get to the server, I don't know if you're meeting the requirements, so I'm just going to deny you. So click OK. And we can actually close out of our DHCP utility. And the next thing we need to do is now set up the settings for our clients. Now this is all done through group policy. And this was a big part of why I wanted to use New York DC 1 for everything. Because that way we could just see it all in one location. So I'm going to click on Start. Go to Administrative Tools, and go to Group Policy Management. In Group Policy Management, I'm going to go in and right-click and edit the default domain policy. So that means I'm going to be affecting every computer in the domain. And that's OK, because the Vista client, New York Vista 1, is within the domain, and this will work. So I'm going to expand Policies, expand Windows Settings, expand Security Settings, and then first place we're going to go, and there's a few different places, and this is definitely where you want to pay real close attention. Stop, take notes if you need to, to make sure you completely get all of these different settings, because they all serve a purpose. So here I have, and you know what, I'll tell you what, let me go ahead and expand this over to the right a little bit. Oh, I missed. There we go, so you can actually see it. Here's network access protection. I'm going to expand that, and here we have NAP Client configuration. I'll even expand that. 
on the enforcement clients. We're going to go ahead and set up which enforcement client we're going to use. And in this case, of course, it's the DHCP quarantine enforcement client. So I'm going to right click and enable it. So now you'll see the DHCP quarantine enforcement client has been enabled. The next place I need to go is I need to go to the system services node over here on the left. And then on the right, we're going to scroll down to network access protection agent. Here's that SHA, the system health agent. So I'm going to double click on it. We're going to define the setting and set the service startup mode to automatic and click OK. So what that means is on all of our clients, not only have we enabled the DHCP quarantine aspect of things, but now we've enabled the actual agent service. Now the last thing we need to do is, and I'll tell you what, let me close up some of this just because it's starting to get a little confusing. I'm going to go down here to administrative templates, expand that, expand Windows components, and then go down here to security center. And then here, I'm going to double click on turn on security center. And we're going to enable that policy. Click OK. And what that has done is that has made it that the security center is on, is definitely on and enabled for all of our clients. So now our clients have all the settings they need to cooperate with network access protection on our network policy server. So let's go ahead and close the group policy management editor. And I have a dialog, but let's see here. Settings have not been applied, so yes, I want to apply the settings. And then we'll, we'll go ahead and close out a group policy management. And now we can go ahead and we can test a client. Oh, real quick, before we test the client, let me, take, let me show you a couple things here. First of all, under policies, for our connection request policy, here's our NAP DHCP policy. And you'll notice that it has a processing order of number of two. And then there's this default one that's built in, which is 999999, meaning this one is only going to be used if there's not another one that matches all the requirements. This is the one that we actually are going to have used. And you'll notice it will be used because it says basically, look, if you're connecting 24-7, we're going to use this one. Here's some network policies. Again, we have our, our defaults that are built in down at the bottom. We saw that with remote access. But up here, we now have a network policy for what happens if you're DHCP compliant, what happens if you're DHCP non-compliant, and what happens if you're not capable of doing NAP. So we have those three policies in place. And then we have the actual health policies, which have to do with, all right, Here's what establishes being compliant, and here's what establishes being non-compliant. If I expand network access protection, you'll see here for system health validators, and you'll see here, here's the Windows Security Health Validator, and it, it's all set up and ready to go. Also, here's our remediation server group, which includes our DHCP remediation servers. So I just want to show you everything is here and accessible. Let's get to the good stuff. Let's go to a client and see what happens. So let's minimize our domain controller and let's connect to New York Vista 1. And I will tell you, I'm not going to be able to connect to New York Vista 1 using remote desktop. And the reason why is because we are going to be making changes to the IP configuration settings of this client. And by making those changes, we would be disconnected from our remote desktop. So I have to actually go to the physical client itself. So let's go there now. OK, here we are on our Vista client. So let me press Control Alt Delete and enter in my password to log into the Global Mantics domain. And now we are logged into our Vista client. And the first thing I want to do here is I want to go ahead and click start and then in the start search window here I'm gonna say GP update slash force now the reason I'm gonna do this let me hit enter and then I'm gonna tell you wh what's happening here this is forcing the Vista client to go out to Active Directory and get an update of all the group policies and apply those settings 
Okay, and you'll see here that the user policy update has completed successfully and the computer update. Um, it says that some of these policies can only be run during startup. It wants to know if it's okay to restart. Um, I probably have another setting that has been set from before that is causing this to happen because I will tell you that I know for a fact that none of the settings that I set require a reboot. So I'm going to say no, it's not okay to restart. And everything should still work okay. I just want you to know that if you got that message, um, it, you shouldn't need to restart. There are certain settings in group policy that can only be done during a restart. They cannot be modified live. But the three settings that we did, they should all be able to be done live. So let's actually go ahead and do this and, well, let's see what happens. So I'm going to click on Start. And I'm going to open up a command prompt window, but I need to do it as the administrator in order to be able to perform complete functionality. Now, I know you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, we are logged in as the administrator. Even if you're logged in as the administrator, you need to right-click and select Run as Administrator because there's built-in protection in Vista that prevents you from being able to do certain things unless you go out of your way to say, yes, I do mean to be doing this. Now the first thing I want you to type in, if you're following along, is netsh, and then we're going to put nap client show state, because I want to see what the state of all the different client agents are. And when I hit enter, what I should find is that the DHCP quarantine should be enabled. So I need to scroll back up, because there's a lot of information here, and it should be right up here near the top, I go down a little bit. And here it is. The DHCP Quarantine Enforcement Client, which is ID 79617. You'll see here initialized, yes. Whereas you'll notice the other enforcement clients, Remote Access and Terminal Services Gateway, EAP, all these others, they all say no. So we have successfully enabled DHCP Quarantine Client just as we asked it to. So now that we've done that, I'm going to go ahead and type in ipconfig slash release to make sure that if it had an IP address before, that IP address is gone. Uh, I don't know why I'm being asked to solve computer problems, but it has nothing to do with this, so I'm just going to close that window. And now I'm going to go ahead and put in ipconfig slash renew to ask for a new IP address. Now it'll take just a moment here while it's trying to connect with the DHCP server. And what it's doing is it's taking a look at the overall health status of this client. There we go. And what it determined was that it did not meet the health requirements. And the reason I know that is because although I was given an IP address of 192.168.10.50, look at my subnet mask. It's all 255s. Notice I do not have my default gateway. I don't have everything that I'm supposed to have, and that is because I have not met the health requirements. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, why haven't you met the health requirements? Well, I'm going to show you that. In order to show you that, we're going to go back to our New York DC1 server. So let's head back on over there right now. Okay, back here on New York DC1. If we look at our system health validators, and I go into the properties by double clicking on this and then click on configure you will see that what we are requiring for our Vista clients is that a firewall be enabled antivirus application be on and up to date and a spyware application is on and up to date and automatic updates need to be enabled now I can tell you that my Vista client Although the firewall may be enabled and automatic updates may be enabled, I, I believe they both are. Spyware, mm, it may be on. I'd have to go look and see if Defender was running or not. But I know for a fact that there is no antivirus application on that machine. Now, if you're following along and on your Vista computer, you actually met all these requirements, well, then you would have gotten a valid IP address. So... The reason I didn't, though, is because of this antivirus for sure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear the checkboxes for antivirus, and spyware, and even automatic updates. And I'm going to leave just firewall. Okay, So firewall needs to be enabled for all network connections in order to meet 
these requirements. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK and OK once again. So now we have updated this Security Health Validator. So now let's head on back over to our Vista client. OK, back here on New York Vista 1, what I want to do is I want to validate that the firewall is indeed enabled. So I'm going to click on Start, Control Panel, and then select Windows Firewall. And you'll see here that Windows Firewall is helping to protect my computer. It's a nice green bar, got a green shield, check mark, everything's on. So if I come back here to my command prompt and I do an ipconfig slash release and then an ipconfig slash renew, which again is just to release any IP address I previously had and then to now ask for another one, let me hit enter. You will see here that what should happen this time, and there it goes, is we do indeed get a valid IP address. And we know that it's valid because we have an IP address, a valid subnet mask, a default gateway. If I were doing IP config slash all, we would see that all of the specific requirements have been met. And actually, here's even the quarantine state letting you know that it's not restricted. That would, that would be another way to see that that old IP address was not valid. Now in the background here, this is just, it's saying, hey, you just established a new network, what is this? I'm gonna go ahead and say work, because this is the, the work location for this Vista client. It's, it's in our domain environment, so I'll close that. All right, now what I wanna show you next is what I think is super cool. I'm gonna come back here to the Windows Firewall, and I'm gonna go to where it says turn Windows Firewall on or off. I'm going to click that and then turn it off. I'm going to say, nope, turn this firewall off. Click OK. It goes to off. And now I didn't click anything. That was not a magic trick, no sleight of hand. It automatically turned back on. And that's because we have auto remediation enabled. Let's try that again. Turn it off. Click OK. I won't touch the mouse. Boom, it turns back on. That's super cool. So if you have requirements that fall within simple things like your firewall being turned on, automatic updates being enabled, even the potential of spyware and antivirus being brought up to date, if you have access to servers that can update you, then you will be assisted through this process without any user intervention. And that I think is really cool. So anyway, let's go ahead and close Windows Firewall and uh, our command prompt, our control panel, and go ahead and go back and take a look at what we've covered in this video. All right, well, that's pretty much it for NAP. And after watching this video, you should now know how to describe how NAP can be used to protect your network. You should be able to describe what the different enforcement types are and you should now know how to install and configure the network policy service, including the overall setup of network access protection. I understand this is a lot. It can be confusing. There are a lot of steps. Don't be shy at all about going back and watching this video again and going through and practicing this a few times until you really begin to be comfortable with network access protection. Because this can truly be a major component when it comes to the security of your network.